I want to welcome you to the YouTube uh, channel of the International Institute uh, for Peace. I am Heinz Gärtner. Uh, today is July 14, uh, 2023. Today's topic is uh, the NATO uh, summit in uh, Vilnius. Uh, today's guest is uh, Robert Hunter. Robert Hunter uh, has an excellent knowledge uh, on NATO from inside, but also from outside. He was a uh, US ambassador to NATO in the 90s, and also he served on the National Security Council uh, staff. Uh, from outside, he was a senior advisor of the think tank, the Rent Corporation, and he also was director of the Center for Transatlantic uh, Security uh, Studies at the National Defense University. He regularly also uh, contributes to uh, the publications of the Quincy Institute, and you can see him uh, regularly on the TV stations and CNN and uh, Al Jazeera. So the NATO summit uh, is over. Uh, I briefly, when it comes to Ukraine, I briefly summarize uh, the uh, results. Um, NATO, uh, NATO did not uh, promise uh, Ukraine a timetable for membership, uh, but it pledged uh, member states of NATO pledged new and more military and financial aid. Uh, but Ukraine did not get hard security uh, guarantees like it would be enshrined in Article 5 uh, of NATO, uh, what President uh, Zelensky uh, uh, wished uh, for. So what does this uh, result mean uh, for the war? So we have continuous military and financial aid. So, and there's always the danger that uh, the military escalation uh, would move into Russia proper. That was that it was NATO uh, wants to avoid by all circumstances. So, Robert, what is your prediction? So, is there a danger that it, this gap will come? ever uh, closer, more military aid, uh, and at the same time, escalation uh, to Russia and invo more involvement uh, of NATO. Well, th thank you, Heinz. It's a uh, privilege once again to be involved with you and with, with, with your people. Uh, let me start by saying uh, uh, happy 14 juillet. Uh, this is uh, Bastille Day in France. And uh, maybe both of us would wish we were in Paris now for all of the celebrations. Uh, let me just say, with regard to uh, your your question, uh, you are absolutely right that the desire is to support Ukraine in its military effort to uh, stop and then roll back to the extent possible uh, the Soviet incursion into Ukraine. But at the same time, uh, to avoid uh, escalation to something that could be uh, far worse. I'm not even going to talk about nuclear weapons. I think that is uh, not something that either side really would contemplate, uh, to, uh, despite what uh, Mr. Putin has said at uh, uh, various times. But uh, there is always a danger uh, of things getting out of control. There is an old saying, uh, the toughest things is to predict is about the future. And uh, the weaponry that is going to be given now to uh, uh, Ukraine, which is going to be of a, of a higher order of capability, could lead the Ukrainians uh, to miscalculate or to avoid the strictures that are very clearly being placed on it, especially by the United States, and try to uh, reclaim everything uh, that they have already lost, and then who knows what the Russians would do. So it is going to be a balance, but uh, I expect it to go on for a considerable time. And regrettably, if I may reach for an historical parallel, this is like the Second Battle of the Somme, 
1916, in which uh, there were lots of civilian casualties, and they were all French. Uh, the casualties in this war, except for uh, some people who are in uh, uh, Russian-occupied areas who have a Russian background, uh, the uh, casualties, casualties are all Ukrainian, the civilian casualties. So uh, we have a situation right now of virtual stalemate, and the real issue in the short term, therefore, is how do you move from virtual stalemate uh, to a situation in which both sides would be willing to negotiate. And right now, neither side is, at least neither side says that it is. Yeah, you're yeah, talking about stalemate. So that was, it. of course, is, it is one uh, scenario that uh, the stalemate uh, will uh, remain. So, and we know this, you're bringing analogies. Uh, we know this from history, uh, where the armies stand, there will be a division. So we know this from the end of the Second World War, uh, and we know this from the divided uh, Germany and uh, also in uh, Korea. So you have a permanent division and there is one possibility that you have a permanent uh, division of Ukraine for a very long time uh, if you have this scenario. So what would that mean for NATO membership? Uh, that would mean that uh, NATO would probably or not take in a truncated Ukraine, not the whole Ukraine, but a truncated uh, Ukraine. If this happens, of course, that means a de facto recognition of the occupation of the other territories, which are occupied by Russia. First question, would NATO do this? Second scenario is we have a permanent fighting until all Russian troops uh, leave uh, Ukrainian uh, territory. That can take a very, very long time. So that would mean that Ukraine is now much further away during the war from NATO membership than it was in 2008 at the Bucharest summit when there was still uh, the peace and the possibility that I might get a membership action plan sometime in the future. Over two questions, separation truncated Ukraine, would NATO accept, could, could NATO accept this? Second, uh, permanent uh, fighting for a very, very long time uh, that uh, Ukraine can become a NATO member. Well, first, I don't think uh, the idea of perpetual war is something that either side is going to want to tolerate uh, or, or, or outsiders who might at some point have some influence with the pro big problem of influence is how to get Mr. Putin to recognize that he's not going to be able to achieve what he tried uh, to achieve. Uh, I don't expect, and here I'm going out on a limb, uh, that at any point uh, the Ukraine will recover Crimea, which incidentally is only in Ukraine by accident, if one goes back to the history of 1952, when Khrushchev moved it from the Russian uh, Federal, Soviet Federal Republic of the Soviet Union over to the Ukrainian side. So that was an accident. Now, in regard to uh, NATO membership, I think you're absolutely right. In some ways, Ukraine is farther away from membership than it was potentially in 2008. Uh, after all, uh, it was made very clear that even having a roadmap uh, to membership will not happen until after the war comes to an end. The U.S. president made this very clear. And of course, the 800-pound gorilla in NATO is and will continue to be uh, the United States. Now, I am a skeptic uh, compared to conventional wisdom that Ukraine will ever join NATO, uh, no matter what size or shape it uh, it happens to be. And we can talk about what, the, what that might look like uh, later, if you'd like, because it takes consensus. All 31 countries have to agree. What will happen, what would happen, as always happens at NATO, is the Secretary General lays before the Council what's called a decision sheet. This would be 
Ukraine to become a NATO member, and then any single ally can speak out against it, and that that's the end of it. And I, at this point in history, I cannot imagine that all 31 countries will be under any conceivable right now circumstance be willing to accept responsibility to Ukraine for implementing Article 5, which, as you know, has two parts. Number one, it's uh, aggression uh, against any one country is considered as aggression against all. That's, in effect, a declaration of war. And what Mr. Biden and everybody else is trying, except some people in the, some countries in the East are trying to avoid, is a direct war with Russia. It is a war now, but there's still the fiction that everybody's prepared to accept everywhere uh, that this is not an actual war. Uh, but if you invoke Article 5 with Ukraine in and the fighting is still going on, you're at war. Uh, secondly, of course, Article 5 says, does not require anybody to do anything. It merely says each country in NATO acting according to its constitutional processes will decide what to do about it. Uh, to send, uh, uh, to be called an involved military if they want, but they don't have to. And uh, there are some countries that would never want to do this. But I don't believe that even after the war is over, that 31 members of NATO, then be 32 with uh, Sweden, are going to say, yes, we will give an Article 5 commitment to, to Ukraine. Certainly not before the war ends. Back in 2008, uh, that condition wasn't applied. Uh, I don't think the Allies meant it back in 2008. It was just a convenience uh, because the American president, uh, George W. Bush, wanted a push for the membership of Ukraine and Georgia. Remember that, and Georgia. And several Allies said, no, come on, we're, we're not prepared to do that. So they came up with this formulation that said, Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO. For most NATO members, that meant never. That's off sometime in the distant future. We're not going to have to think about it. And But that's not been made formal, that uh, uh, you don't even have to think about joining NATO until at least until after uh, uh, the war comes to an end. And then there will be conditions uh, uh, to be considered. Uh, the conditions, incidentally, were uh, applied early on to try to help potential new members become uh, good democracies uh, to deal with internal problems like corruption. And one of the striking things about, uh, about Ukraine, even since the war began, is they've done nothing about corruption, nothing about it. Uh, it is not as corrupt as, uh, uh, as Russia, but it's certainly not uh, as uncorrupt as I think any of the existing NATO allies. And also another condition is to get your military uh, up to speed. And Ukraine is moving very rapidly on that. Some people argue it's already the most, uh, uh, the, the strongest military in, uh, outside potentially of, Europe, of Russia uh, in Europe. Now, uh, let, let's face one thing. There are no conditions for joining NATO. There's a, except for one, the only condition for joining NATO, the only one is that all NATO allies are prepared to apply, if need be, Article 5. And as I'm arguing right now, certainly, and now this is out in the open and agreed, that can't happen while the current war is going on. There will be no Ukrainian membership before that. And unless Russia does something uh, that so far it hadn't shown a willingness and, or ability to do, uh, it's not going to happen uh, while the war is going on. Uh, and uh, afterwards, uh, we, we shall see. But I don't believe, again, that all 31 countries will be prepared in the event of a renewal of the war to go to war against Russia. Final point, back in the 1990s, we had to figure out how, as NATO was expanding, uh, to prevent provoking Russia into some kind of hostile action. Uh, Ukraine, we, we got rid of the concept of buffer states or sphere of influence. Uh, sphere of influence we still deny, 
but Ukraine is going to be seen by the West and by Russia as a buffer state. I don't want to use the term, but that's how it's going to be seen. And the fact that that was already clear in 1997, when NATO decided to take in its first three members with the prospect of others coming in, and when NATO signed with the uh, Russian Federation in May of 1997, the so-called NATO-Russia Founding Act, which has an extraordinary range of cooperative measures in order to compensate Ukraine, not going to get membership through the membership process that was started. Uh, and it's going to be not going to be consigned to any Russian sphere of influence. So we came up with a thing called the uh, NATO-Russia Council, uh, not Council, sorry, uh, NATO-Russia Charter. And in the final bits of which I negotiated with the then uh, Ukrainian ambassador Belzim, who also worked with NATO, who then became foreign minister, uh, Boris uh, Tereshuk, who uh, very distinguished uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, diplomat. Uh, but that, in effect, ratified uh, Ukraine as a, uh, a uh, buffer state. Now, at the end of the uh, Vilnius summit, they decided, the Allies decided, to create a Ukraine commission, the NATO-Ukraine commission. Not, no, I'm sorry, not commission. Council. 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 Sorry, council. Which was to permit uh, Ukraine uh, to sit around the tables and equal with uh, uh, with uh, with NATO. Let me let me be very frank about it. And the 1997 charter, there was agreed to be a commission, NATO Ukraine commission, which would allow Ukraine at any point it wanted to, to call the allies together and meet with them to talk about what its concerns or its security were. Uh, frankly, the difference between the commission and the council, which we agreed this week, is more in the name than anything else. It has more technical quality to it, but it's really the same thing. It was, again, a compensation to Ukraine for not giving it what it wanted, which was membership. We can talk about why that didn't happen and, and what was going on and why. Even the discussion about it, I believe, uh, was a bad thing for the future of Ukraine and the future of uh, NATO security. Yeah, you you talked about what happens uh, once uh, the war uh, ends. Uh, of course, there is already a, a debate about this. It will affect uh, the NATO-Russian relations, the NATO-Ukraine relations, the Ukraine-Russian relations. So uh, that will be a very complicated uh, mix of political uh, decisions. So they are under discussion uh, in a nutshell, uh, what happens to European security after the war? Will we have if European security with Russia, without Russia, or against Russia? Uh, there is, of course, this scenario uh, what happens uh, if it is against uh, Russia? That, me that what means that we will have an isolated uh, Russia. So, in some scenarios, I, I guess yourself mentioned that in one of your articles, could be a Versailles 1919 uh, situation, which might even be worse, what is going to happen in Russia. Another uh, scenario uh, would be uh, that uh, the war and the isolation would leave a big North Korea in the east of Europe, a big North Korea uh, with nuclear weapons, uh, Russia, that the only means they have to is to blackmail the Europeans with nuclear weapons. Economically, they are very weak uh, already. They will be, Russia will be weaker, even much weaker after, uh, after the war. So that would be uh, the doomsday scenario. Of, of course, there are other scenarios which uh, are discussed. Uh, we had during the height of the Cold War, there was the CAC Helsinki Conference, which tried to mitigate uh, the high tension and reduce uh, the arms uh, race at that time. Another historical analogy would be uh, Vienna 
1815, the concert. So this would be the more integrative uh, scenario. So we have the scenario of isolation or the scenario of somehow partial uh, integration of Russia. So what is your take on this uh, global uh, European scenario after, after the war? Wow. Uh, one thing I think is clear, Heinz, is for your institute and other institutes, uh, we're not going to go out of business. <laughs> it's going to be an awful lot to think about and look at. If I uh, had a magic wand to end the war, uh, I would come up with a formula like uh, Minsk II. Uh, I would call it Minsk III, uh, which would, in effect, and this is really reaching for it, accepting Ukrainian sovereignty, certainly over the areas outside Crimea and probably, and ideally including Crimea, Ukrainian sovereignty, but some form of rigorous autonomy for the areas that are Russian speaking, Russian culture, and the like. In effect, the Russians would uh, have a, uh, a primus inter paris uh, within those areas. That that wouldn't be my kind of uh, a scenario on that. Now, with and, and with regard to the long range with Russia, of all the historical analogies, uh, the one I like back like best is uh, Vienna, eighteen fifteen or even Westphalia 1648. But uh, I, don't, I don't see that happening. But you put your finger on, if you're gonna reach to the long term, let us assume the war comes to an end. Let us assume that Ukraine is reconciled to whatever the outcome is. Let us assume that Russia uh, sees itself reconciled to what its uh, concern was about NATO surrounding Russia. And I don't think we can ignore totally ignore uh, the, the Russian concerns about that, which were not just Putin, but Russian concerns uh, uh, general. You just can't do that in international politics. And if you look for another historical analogy on that, uh, think about a thing called the Monroe Doctrine of 1823, which we still apply in the Western Hemisphere. We Americans, we didn't like Castro, we didn't like Noriego, we didn't like uh, uh, that guy who was in... Uh, Nicaragua was back in power again, and we invaded Grenada, okay? Uh, so we apply the Monroe Doctrine. But, uh, and the Russians kind of want a Monroe Doctrine of its own, but it can't have it in terms of sphere of influence. That, that's already ruled out. But here is the long term, and I don't know what long term is, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Russia will not continue to be supine. Its economy will recover. Let's say absent war. They have a huge amount of natural resources. Uh, they have had a very good educational system when it comes, at least, to what we in the West now call STEM, which science, technology, I don't know, engineering and mechanics or whatever STEM or mathematics, whatever STEM means, uh, that is the hard sciences. Uh, and, uh, and it will recover and it will be a major player. Uh, that's something that uh, we understood in, when the Cold War came to an end. We understood the Soviet Union has lost. It was the largest collapse of any internal empire and external empire, Eastern Europe, in peacetime in all of history. Nothing like that happened. So, okay, so here was Russia on the floor back in 1991, Christmas night, when it formally came to an end, and other republics of the, all the other, uh, of the 15 republics all went independent. Uh, whether that was a good idea or not, historically, not even worth talking about. That included Ukraine becoming uh, independent uh, uh, as, as along with the others. Now, what to do about it? Now, you mentioned uh, the Treaty of Versailles. And there were smart people in the George H.W. Bush administration. And I like to think there were some smart people in the Clinton administration, which I served during the most important period uh, during the uh, Clinton administration for four and a half years, when we put together the new architecture for security in Europe based upon, fundamentally upon what happens with NATO and other things. And I like to think I was 
one of the leading architects, and certainly one of the leading negotiators of all that. But we look back to the Treaty of Versailles, and uh, you can look this up, anybody can. Article 231 of the Treaty of Versailles, the so-called War Guilt Clause, Germany was forced to accept that, which put all the guilt for World War I on to, to Germany, which was obviously nonsense. Uh, the guilt that his responsibility for starting war uh, was on the backs of a lot of countries, uh, including, <laughs> I may say so, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, France, Britain, uh, all, all shared responsibility along with Germany. Well, the War Guilt Clause was put in in order to create a legal basis to demand reparations from Germany to rebuild uh, in parts of other countries, most insisted upon by France, but also by the United Kingdom, and supported, obviously, because it was in the Treaty of Versailles, and the United States was signatory, the United States went along with that. Well, what happened? This was used by German revanchists, including an Austrian named Adolf Hitler, as evidence that Germany was being punished for something it was only partly responsible for, and that it and that it was being done down. And it was one of the arguments that Hitler used in his campaign for the Nazis to come to power, and then to do all the things that uh, we saw him do, beginning with the military remilitarization of the Rhineland, to going back into the into the Ruhr, and then uh, uh, all the other things that that we've seen, uh, in which your country suffered. To, uh, terribly through the Anschluss of uh, uh, which preceded the uh, partition of uh, partition of uh, Czechoslovakia. So we were bound and determined not to repeat that, and that meant whatever we were going to do to build security post Cold War could not push Russia away, could not do that, because that could lead at some point when Russia recovered. At the time, people used to joke, it's, oh, it's Guatemala with nuclear weapons. Well, that was a bad thing to say, but uh, most people didn't. And so as we built the new uh, uh, security or built on NATO, we developed first a thing called Partnership for Peace, which was open to all members of the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, which, as you know, is based in Vienna. And it at the time, it had 35 countries. I think it has 57 countries now, something like that. You'll, you'll know the exact number. But uh, we said everybody could join Partnership for Peace, which was about transformations of militaries, helping countries be in the East become democracies, help them have a basis to get on with economic regeneration, which was done through, I guess it was called the European uh, wasn't the European Union at that point. I uh, can't even remember. They kept ch keep changing their name as they had more members. It was to help all these these uh, countries uh, uh, become better off. But at the time, Russia, like everybody else, members of OSCE, was offered a place. In fact, I was part of a team in 1994, which went from NATO headquarters to Moscow to negotiate with the Russian Federation its membership in the Partnership for Peace and the parallel Euro-Atlantic uh, Partner, what is the Euro-Atlantic Partnership Council, which I guess, uh, which still exists. Uh, the NATO-Russia Founding Act of 1997 created a, a special council with a special meeting facility between NATO and uh, the Russians in which NATO met together and decided a position and then talk to Russia. So it was uh, at that point, I guess it was 19 plus one. And then in 2002, they augmented that to a full uh, NATO Russia council in which Russia sat around the table as it and still could, even though it's in abeyance at the moment, uh, as an equal with the NATO allies. And any decision taken by the NATO Russia council about cooperation, about arms control, about all kinds of things. Everybody had equal status, and everybody, the NATO members plus Russia, 
uh, could uh, could veto if they wanted, just like uh, NATO has uh, the uh, consensus principle. Uh, now, further, in the effort so that Russia would not be pushed away, uh, there were various uh, economic things that were done. There were efforts to to work with the Russian military. In fact, one of the things that was most striking in 1990, sorry to go on about this, but you want us to know the history, sure. how we got there. 1995, when the uh, Bosnia War came to an end, and incidentally, Russia, along with the Finnish president, uh, was uh, uh, nego helped negotiate, or at least provide the basis for negotiation by supporting what became uh, the Dayton Accords, which ended the Bosnia War, okay? As part of that, there was created with UN sanction. And the reason Russia supported the end of the war is there was a United Nations Security Council resolution. And the reason they did not support the later war against Serbia over Kosovo, 1998, is because there was no United Nations Security Council resolution. So the Russians saw this to be an illegal war, whereas the, the Bosnian War was considered by Russia to be a legal war. Okay. Comes to an end under Dayton, created a thing called the Implementation Force, I-4. You go into uh, Bosnia, all parts of Bosnia, uh, which was the, the effort was to have a unitary government, and they're still working at that, but at least nobody's died since 1995 except a few minor incidents, which is a huge achievement. And the Russians said, we would like to be part of this I-4. We'd like to. So the, Mr. Gratchev came to NATO headquarters and there was a meeting in my office as NATO ambassador with the Russian defense minister, the secretary of defense of the United States, Bill Perry, and the commander of NATO and US forces of uh, the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, George Jowan, four-star U.S. general, met in my office. And Grachev said, we want to be part of this I-4. Come on. This will be like the good old days meeting at the Elba in uh, April 1945, where the United States and, Ru and the Soviet Union, the two big participants in the Second World War against Germany, came together and shook hands and, and all of that. And they were the two big countries that made the uh, the arrangements uh, after that, though the British and then the French were also involved in. So, but the, but Gotchev said, no, but there is a problem. He said, what's the problem? He said, we cannot put Russian forces under NATO command. You got to understand that we can't do that. NATO is the historic enemy. So George Jowan brought up some big charts that he had made up and they showed various things. And it, and it showed... Sakur, Supreme Allied Commander, uh, commanding I-4, and then commanding the various NATO allies, plus a bunch of others, neutral countries and others. I, I don't know whether Austria was part of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You were or were not? Yes. Yes, you were, okay. Yeah. He said, and the rest of that, we can't do that. He said, well, let me show you something else. Here is the United States European Command, okay, run by an American general, and we can descend from that, and Russia could be part of I-4, but not under NATO command, but under American command. And Grotschev said, that's, that's fine. That's fine. We don't mind being under American commands, back to the elbow, where it makes us look like a big power, and, and fine. So they agreed on that. Russia sent its very best troops to I-4, worked very effectively with I-4, the Americans and the Russians worked together. I remember one occasion in which uh, there were some Americans who were in a facility and they were being uh, uh, surrounded by some Serbs who, who were there. So we, oh, maybe, it was one of, maybe it was the Bosnian Serbs. And the United States got on the phone and called the Russians and the Russians came to the rescue. Okay. Uh, but so it did work. Where it changed was at the end of the 1990s, even though there had been the NATO-Russia Founding Act, the NATO-Ukraine Charter, and look at the NATO-Ukraine uh, Founding Act. It's got some amazing principles, and it's got 19 areas of cooperation. It's a fantastic document, fantastic document. 
signed at the Elysee on the 27th of May, uh, uh, 1997. The French has, were skeptical about joining this. And so I said, why don't we agree to have it signed in France at the Elysee? And at that point, all the French objections went away because they got a chance to, to host the, the signing. Well, then, beginning with NATO going into Kosovo, and then a series of things happened. The people and the United States government who understood you cannot have a repetition of the Treaty of Versailles. You cannot cast Russia into the outer darkness. You cannot say Russia, largest part of the former Soviet Union, lost the war. So to hell with them. They're going to come back, and we need to treat them with respect. Those people in the U.S. government laughed, a new group came in, and they said, oh, Russia lost the war. Who cares about them? So the United States started taking some unilateral actions. For one thing, it abrogated the ABM Treaty of 1972. That seemed logical. Well, we don't need it anymore. We're no, there's no longer a nuclear standoff with the Soviet Union and Russia. So get rid of it. Well, except the problem was that was one of the few things that enabled Russia to say, see, we're still a big boy. We did it anyway. Uh, then, for a variety of reasons, as, as you will know, uh, in the middle of the 2000s, uh, the United States, with its allies, but particularly the United States, uh, decided to put some anti-ballistic missiles in Central Europe. And why? To defend against North Korean missiles and Iranian missiles, if and when they came into being. Now, I'm not a physicist, but the physicist said, well, you have to put these things in Central Europe in order to protect against a, a North Korean attack, including against the United States. I don't know where that came from. Adding Iran, Iran to it was not because they had missiles. It was because the Israel lobby wanted it. Okay, That was American domestic politics. Well, okay. The Russians said, hey, wait a second. What about our nuclear deterrent? This can be directed against our nuclear deterrent. We said, no, you know, that's just a tiny little thing. And the United States was right. There's no threat to the NATO, the Russian nuclear deterrent. But that was not the point. The point was, this was taking place in former members of the Warsaw Pact. And it was once again showing that Russia was nobody. It was nobody. But we went ahead anyway. And there were some other things. We would, The Russians didn't abide by all parts of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Force Treaty. So we withdrew from it. Uh, the Russians weren't with, abiding by all parts of the uh, Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, and so it was put into abeyance by the Russian side. So by 2008, uh, the relationship with Russia was very in not good shape, not good shape, uh, because a bunch of people did stupid things. Uh, we did most of the stupid things, Treaty of Versailles. And uh, the Russians did some stupid things as well. And there was a warning. And I'll stop at this point. Putin came to the Munich Security Conference in 2007. And said, like, everything I've said is on the internet. You can look it up. And Putin made a speech in which he said, you're disrespecting us. Come on. Uh, you know, we're, you, you can't. That's not the way you should treat others. Now, the American president I like, I, and I can get along him, but you can't, you, you gotta take us seriously. Uh, I was in the room when it happened. Everybody laughed at him, his speech, except Angela Merkel, who was one, who was the, one of the smartest European leaders, most effective, and being following on the tradition of Chancellor Kohl, who had as much as anybody else to put uh, some of the original architecture, post-World War architecture together, but people didn't listen to him. And then it got to what I've already described in 2008, not just for Ukraine, for Georgia. And that played into Russian paranoia, but also played into Mr. Putin's arguments at home. See what's being done to us. Now, it wasn't being done then. It wasn't going to be done maybe forever. Well, there was another little thing that happened. I denounced that immediately. I said, come on, don't you understand what you just did? Ukraine and Georgia will join NATO. I said, that's the moment of commitment. That's the moment in which you say, legally, formally, technically, 
by NATO law, that's saying these countries are NATO members. It's not what it meant, but that's what the word said. Okay. Well, that's how the Russians read it. Another country that read it that way was Georgia, Mr. Saakashvili. So he says, oh, I'm going to be a NATO member. So I am going to get back the areas of my country that have been occupied by breakaway parts of my country and supported by Russia. Uh, Abkhazia was part of it, but South Ossetia. So, so I'm going to get back South Ossetia. And so he sent Georgian troops into South Ossetia, even though an assistant secretary of state, Dan Freed, telephoned the foreign minister just before her. He said, don't do this. And in fact, Dan Freed will confirm that. Go ask him. I did not too long ago. He said, yeah, I called the foreign minister and said, don't do this. Well, Sarkis really said, who cares what you think? He went into South Ossetia believing that NATO would have its back. NATO said, we're not going to do anything. The Americans gave them some military aid, and everything, but nobody went to war for Georgia. In effect, showing the decision, 2008, didn't mean anything. At the time, I said, gosh, I hope we don't do something stupid with regard to Ukraine. Well, we had the problems which you will know about in 2014, in which there was a legally elected president of Ukraine who was pro-Russia. Pro uh, not a great idea. Uh, and he abrogated an agreement that had been worked out with the European Union, which would have been a great thing for uh, for Ukraine, and frankly, it shouldn't have mattered to Russia. And so there was the uh, the rioting, and it took place in the Maidan, which is if you've been, I don't know if you've been to Kiev, it's right in the center of uh, right in the center of Kiev. A lot of people got killed, uh, particularly by people on the non-pro-Russian side. And the president left the country to go to Russia, and then they had to come up with somebody new. So a different American sec assistant secretary of state got on the telephone to the American ambassador in Kiev on an open line and said, I think Charlie is the guy we would like to come into power. Okay. Not of American business, all right? But it was represented by Russia as a coup. Well, you can debate that, but it was used by Putin uh, as an excuse to go into Crimea and to the Donbass uh, three or four weeks later. He was probably already a reason to do it, but he had a nice excuse. Incidentally, if you want to hear about that uh, effort to put our person in, it's on. It's on the website. Uh, it was the conversation was intercepted, probably by Russia. They put it on the internet. And the BBC has a wonderful website, which uh, which you can listen to it, and you can read the transcript. Okay, and so then we were off to the races, uh, and then NATO did things at the Welsh, uh, the Wales Summit and all of that. That, believe me, in no way does that justify what Putin did in 2022. In no way justifies any of the war crimes. No way justifies any of the brutality and the slaughter being undertaken by Mr. Putin. But it still leaves us with a problem. Not just uh, how do you stop the war, stop the killing, and what does it look like uh, in Ukraine afterwards, but what about down the road, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, in which Russia will again be a great power? And incidentally, it wouldn't no matter who's president. Putin can die of a natural death or get assassinated. Any Russian leader would want to do that. And we got to think about that. And that's why I think maybe the worst thing that came out of the Vilnius uh, uh, summit was when the American president, in effect, formally declared a new Cold War. And in effect, appropriated into the Vilnius communique, elements effectively of the Treaty of Versailles. Now, I understand why it was done and all that kind of stuff, but nobody was prepared to face up to the potential consequences 5, 10, 15 years from now. And uh, I'm too old, I'm, and you're younger than me, but you're getting on there. I don't think we'll have to face it, but the generation that comes after us uh, 
He's going to have to face that. Well, good luck to him. Uh, I have a final question. Uh, you said um, that uh, in 10, 15, 20 years from now, Russia might revive and be a great uh, power again. Uh, but of course, there's in the US, the, not only in the US, also in Europe, there are some observers who rather say uh, Russia will disintegrate, so uh, fall uh, apart, that uh, the US can concentrate on China. And of course, in the final communique of NATO, this China plays a big uh, part here uh, as well. And uh, also Article 5, and some, under some circumstances, is applied to China. Because when it comes to the, the communique, would say uh, malicious cyber and hybrid activities of the People's Republic uh, of China, what it might invoke Article 5. That means that NATO would be drawn into Asia, but also on the other hand, if you apply Article 5, uh, Asia and the confrontation US-China might be drawn into Europe because you have, of course, NATO members, are, most of them are, are Europeans. Uh, so, of course, we, we all discuss uh, the situation of, uh, of uh, Taiwan, and there was a recent uh, a survey of the European Council on Foreign Relations among European Union citizens. And they would say the question, if it comes to a conflict between China and the US over Taiwan, would you side with China, with the US, or would stay neutral? So 62 to 65% would stay, I would say, I'd rather stay neutral European citizens. We don't want to be drawn in a war that is not uh, ours. So was it a good idea to apply, already it was in the last communique, I say, to apply Article 5 to cyber activities uh, of China? And we know how hard it is to attribute a cyber attack to an enemy. So it, it, at the end, it would be a political decision by the NATO Council. So it is because you can always say our intelligence uh, has told us we have to decide. So the Europeans would not have the capacity really to read the pictures and the uh, information of the intelligence. So Europeans would be drawn into the conflict if it really comes push, uh, push into, uh, sh uh, sh shove into push. Uh, uh, what what is your what is your take now? Is it a good idea to include Article Five to apply security commitments, uh, and if it uh, China is involved? Well, first you ask all the right questions and have the right uh, perspective. I wish you'd been in the U.S. National Security Council helping to plan the Vilnius Summit, but you weren't. Unfortunately, incidentally, I should mention, it's not just 5, 10, 20 years now uh, with regard to Russia. It is already getting engaged in places like the Middle East, which we and others have very important interests. Uh, and they are going to be involved in, in Africa and elsewhere. So even in the short term, you can't write off uh, uh, Russia. Uh, with regard to Russia disintegrating, and yes, there are people who would like to see Russia disintegrate and want to see this war prosecuted to the overthrow of Putin and uh, the disintegration of Russia. Uh, I would say this, be extremely careful what one hopes for. I am not sure any of us would welcome uh, the plethora of republics and countries and interest groups and ethnic groups and everything that would be in a disintegrated Russia. I think we would wish we would even have the old Soviet Union back again. Uh, so uh, that's that's something that is that is the height of insanity, I think, for people to want that. Now, my reading of the communique, maybe I read it wrong, is yes, they repeated the concern collectively about what China is up to, but there were actually very modest steps that were considered that that would happen. Now, one sidebar to this, I should say, is there was a discussion in the communique about 
things that are not what we call kinetic war, that is troops crossing frontiers, like cyber, et cetera, uh, that might rise to the level of invoking Article 5. That would apply to your, and the word is might, would have to be considered. And remember again, all decisions at NATO are taken by consensus. So if there were ever an effort to say, here is what we need to do about China, and we're going to do it through the North Atlantic Council, any country of the 32 can say no. That's the end of it. And lots and lots of countries would listen to your poll and they would say no. Uh, incidentally, there's another thing about trying to apply Article 5 to China, which is a non-starter. Uh, it's called Article 6. Article 6 says, and this was written specifically to please the United States in 1949. Article 6 says, where does Article 5 apply? It applies in Europe, North America, in the North Atlantic, north of the uh, Tropic of Cancer. And at the time, it also applied to Algeria because that was part of metropolitan France. And the treaty had to be tidied up when Algeria went independent. But it can apply uh, to anything beyond uh, uh, the northwest quadrant of, of, of Europe. Just to, could, You couldn't cite Article 5 with regard to China. You'd have to rewrite the treaty. Now, individual countries might be prepared to join with the United States if, God forbid, it came to some kind of conflict. The British have an aircraft carrier that it may even be out there right now. Uh, the French don't want to get left out when there's fighting going on. But for the rest of the others, they're not going to have any part of it. And I, th I think it is a mistake to import into NATO these concerns rather than doing it either separately or if you're talking about the economic relationship with China in which various countries are, are backing away from it, trying to sever supply chains, being more careful about that. That's really a business of individual countries or the European Union. Uh, but for NATO, that was thrown in there merely to please the United States in order to help us not lose the idea of some kind of pivot of Western power uh, to uh, the Far East. But what, what came out of this, I'll just be very blunt about it, uh, the Vilnius decisions, which, and I was against, I, I thought even holding the summit was a bad thing because you have to have deliverables. And among the deliverables is now locking in a new Cold War. And that means with all the decisions that were made, including the G7 decisions with regard to added military support for Ukraine, though to be discussed and decided, what decided was saying, we're going to start talking about it right away tomorrow morning. I think literally tomorrow morning. Uh, you don't have uh, an opportunity there for the United States to back away from its very, very heavy military involvement in Central Europe and against Russia, which is in there. The, the planning and all that is in effect. The Cold War just moved east uh, uh, a few hundred kilometers and also bringing in uh, Finland and Sweden. That's a throw, Sweden's a throwaway because Russia would have to go through Finland before it'd get to Sweden. The fin Swedes know that. I think the Finns were crazy to join NATO, but it's another matter uh, because uh, that just helps provoke the Russians later on to do something. But their choice, their choice. And in the in the heat of the moment, everybody said, come on, Finland, uh, come on in. Uh, but that was their decision. Uh, I think it was the wrong one, but they didn't listen to me. <laughs> like Nobody else listens to me on these things anymore, uh, except maybe your audience. Uh, but the, but the only country that can balance Russia, that can in fact militarily take on Russia is the United States of America. That's always been true in the post-Cold War era as it was in the Cold War. That's why when uh, we had 9-11, United States being attacked, uh, the first ever invocation of Article 5 was because we were attacked by terrorists. Was it because the Allies were worried about the terrorists coming and doing things in Europe and all that, and one for all and all for one? Yes, there was some terrorism in Europe. That's not why they did it. 
the European allies invoking Article 5, which we didn't propose, the Canadians proposed it. We said, oh, you want to do it? Go ahead and do it. It was because the allies were worried we would become so distracted by Afghanistan and by, uh, by uh, uh, terrorism that we'd forget about helping. It was, it was already out of continent. It was NATO out of continent already. Well, no, but uh, the United States is covered by Article 5. Okay. Mm -hmm. United States is covered by Article 5. Yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, uh, uh, NATO uh, sent AWACS flying over the United States, but did not send anything except later on with the uh, force, the NATO force that went into uh, Afghanistan and NATO went in itself. Uh, but that was not an Article 5 thing. And the same happened with, and that was when we put in the NATO force in the Afghanistan. And the U EU put in a force to Afghanistan uh, as well, as you know. And one of the ironies is because NATO and the EU don't work together and they don't work together much more in this communique. Big mistake, again, not to have NATO and the EU working close, more closely together. It's just a few allies on both sides uh, refuse to do it, but it's dumb or it's dumb. Uh, if NATO wanted to work with the EU in Afghanistan, they would have to send a message back to Brussels. Somebody would have to walk it down the street to EU headquarters. They would have to send a message back to Afghanistan, to the EU, to enable the NATO and the EU, who are 15 meters apart, to work together. That's dumb. And the same thing happened with Iraq. The reason allies joined us, except for Germany and France, who were right, Everybody else was wrong in the 2003 invasion of, uh, of Iraq and then joining the post-Iraq war force that was there uh, was not because they were worried about being attacked out of Iraq. It was because they were worried, once again, America would forget about Europe and America's responsibility for uh, dealing with Russia. So what has been decided now is going to diminish the capacity of the United States financially and militarily to work in Asia, despite our $850 billion uh, 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 defense budget. So we're going too far uh, in terms of what we actually need to do. And the United States has locked it in. Uh, incidentally, maybe this is the final point. Uh, Austria is now surrounded by NATO. Austria and Switzerland are all by a little lonesome, plus Ireland and uh, Malta and Cyprus, that's the kind of thing, uh, not being members of, of NATO. Uh, I hope you don't feel so lonely there. The, for, one of the great ideas, and maybe it could be applied to Ukraine later on, is the 1955, uh, remind me what it's called, Act which was permanent neutrality for uh, for Austria, and which has worked very effectively. Worked very effectively. What is it called? State treaty. State treaty. Yeah, the state treaty, but it's separate to neutrality. We have the neutrality law, which is a constitutional law. The same right. state treaty is separate, but it was posed in 1955. Uh, we have a little time for a little anecdote. I have a friend, had a friend, I think he may be dead now, named Heinz Vetschroder who was in charge in the Bundes here of the implementation of uh, things in regard to uh, Austria not being allowed to have certain kind of weaponry, including missiles. And so when they wanted to buy an American anti-tank weapon, forbidden, uh, they went to the Russians and said, we'd like to buy a few of your anti-tank weapons, but we can't do it because of this provision of the state, uh, the state treaty. The Russians say, oh, don't worry about that. We'll uh, we'll finesse that. You can buy some of our anti-tank weapons. And so Austria bought a few and then turned to the United States because it was now permitted and bought a lot. So, uh, and in fact, if you, as you know, if you look at the war planning for uh, Austria throughout the Cold War, uh, coming up the Danube Valley, it was all oriented towards Soviet troops coming up from Hungary with the idea that uh, Austria would in effect have to surrender, couldn't do this, but enough time would be bought 
for U.S. forces in Germany to come south and defend Ukraine. I, I, smart. Very clever. I, I have to add another uh, anecdote, which is uh, true, because uh, it was this neutrality, and there was a because you mentioned Hungary, there was this uh, Hungarian uprising in 1956 that the Soviets suspected uh, the Austrians uh, to uh, give safe haven to some of the insurgents and would threaten uh, Austria. And then the Eisenhower government would respond, I saw it in several documents, would respond that if Austrian neutrality is violated, that would be a case for a third world war. So that means the Eisenhower took Austria's neutrality very seriously because it was credible at that uh, at that time. So it was a good security guarantee uh, because it was respected uh, also by the Americans. However, Robert... wait, wait a second. there was an exception you may not even know about. In 1973, the Amkripa War, the United States wanted to send aircraft from Germany uh, to help Israel and flew across Austria, Shh, didn't tell anybody, and the Russians kept their mouths shut. Yeah. Uh, Robert, I hope our audience will very carefully listen uh, to our discussion, uh, to your insightful uh, presentations and uh, ideas and uh, knowledge. So thank you very much. It was really, really enlightening and uh, uh, we all learned, uh, we are always learning uh, for, uh, of you. And uh, so thank you again and we do it the next time as well, but we will not okay. wait until the next NATO uh, summit. We do it. Well, hopefully. Hans, you, you keep up the good work and, and think about a new conference of Vienna where you we can settle uh, the war over Ukraine. Yeah, it will it will not be Helsinki, it will be Vienna next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Robert. Yeah.